Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see me. Yeah. I, would, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation, Dr. Stephen Piper and Dr. Kendall. I also want to express my gratitude because um, it's something like coming back to the roots for me, coming to Toronto, because one of my major areas of research that I enjoy a lot is uh, pancreatic islet biology. So it's like coming back to the roots of my medical training and my experimental training. And I very much enjoyed the lecture of Professor Bliss Wednesday night. So I really like to be here. And today I want to share with you some data on mechanistic mechanisms of postprandial uh, carbohydrate absorption. And here you see also my name and my affiliation. And um, I start with the disclosure slides. So this project was actually supported by my university. There is a, a promise that my travel will be reimbursed by the Beneo Institute. And I'm also a principal investigator in some pharmaceutical studies. Um, but this is not related to the data I will be showing today. I am an employee of uh, Justus Liebig University, which is one of the typical small universities in Germany near Frankfurt. So whenever you come to Frankfurt, you look north, you will find Gießen. Um, mitigating potential bias. Um, sponsor was not involved in the design and the generation of the results and the publication of the study program. And um, so I'm talking about uh, results that are already published. Uh, this should read 2012, and that is OK. So you have been seeing these kind of slides already before. It's about the regulation of glucose hemostasis. Um, it involves control of endogenous glucose production, which is one of the major issues in my project here. Um, different tissues are involved. Um, I, I'm more interested in liver here in this case, not so much in the peripheral uh, glucose uptake of skeletal muscle or adipose tissue. Um, and here you see some historical data on the right side. Uh, here you see that the plasma glucose levels increase excessively in type 2 diabetes. Uh, sorry. Um, following an oral glucose load. This is because the rates of glucose appearance into the circulation uh, markedly exceed the rates of glucose disappearance. The enhanced glucose appearance results from failure to adequately suppress endogenous glucose output and diminished splanchnic glucose sequestration um, because the appearance of ingested glucose in the circulation is generally normal. So these are some data from Warren and Eckberg. Um, and here you see that the rate of oral glucose appearance uh, is obviously not much different in the control and in the type 2 diabetics. But what you see most uh, is the difference in the endogenous glucose production. And coming to the known glycemic index concept. Um, I would say that um, according to the usage of uh, stable isotopes and, the, and discussing the, the mechanisms of um, the uh, glycemic index, I tried to simplify the, the concept. I would say it's, it's an hypothesis um, that the metabolic effect of um, low glucose uh, GI foods um, relates to the rates at which glucose is absorbed from the small bowel. So the low GI foods, they would travel along the small intestine where they are digested and absorbed more slowly on the left-hand side. And on the other hand, high GI foods would be released from the stomach and be rapidly absorbed 
um, in the upper jejunum. And these are the hypothesized glucose curves that you would see. So one, uh, the low GI foods, they would produce such a flat curve. And with a high GI, you would expect a sharp rise and an, even an undershoot in the uh, glucose uh, curve. So some of the a known model of uh, a low GI and a high GI substance that, um, that is a single substance that is not a complex food would be to study sucrose versus isomaltulose. Uh, isomaltulose is a carbohydrate with a low GI of about 32. It's a disaccharide occurring naturally as a minor component in honey and sugarcane extract. And as you see, uh, it is a sucrose isomer, only that glucose and fructose are connected by an alpha-1,6 glucosidic bond, bond instead of alpha-1,2 in the sucrose. This label also shows you that um, <clears throat> one, of the, um, one of the isotopes we, we use in the position of the C6, because C6 is uh, not metabolized or nearly not metabolized. <clears throat> so when you mm, use the deuterated glucose, um, <clears throat> over here it should be, uh, then uh, you, you can be quite sure that uh, it, the, you can use the dilution principle completely without any metabolization. But looking at the, the known data on isomaltulose, uh, we identified about 20 clinical studies, um, m many of them quite historical from the 80s, and um, so when we ended up with, or we wanted to look at studies that were involved in bolus drinks, because this was our idea to, to look at the uh, gluc uh, gluc glucemic index in a way that would resemble the clinical oral glucose tolerance test. So these studies, um, or when we omitted all the studies with the other macronutrients, we ended up with uh, 10 studies. Uh, in which isomaltulose was compared with glucose or with sucrose. The ingested dose ranged between 50 and 70 gram over a period of 1.5 to 3 hours. The overall postprandial glucose levels were lower after ingestion of isomaltulose. That was quite consistent in these publications. Sometimes they were significant. The the lowering of glucose peaks was significant, but not always. So, for instance, the area on the curves were often not significant. Um, but you could say that the peak glucose levels were about 20 to 35 percent lower throughout. Also, this was true for the um, area on the curve of insulin and the plasma glucose levels. So, knowing this previous um, results or previous publications, we thought that it would be a good model to study sucrose versus isomaltulose to identify the kinetics of glucose absorption under the concept of the glucemic uh, index. And um, this shows you basically the study design. Um, after an overnight fast, uh, a hyperinsulinemic euclysemic clamp was initiated by continuous infusions of insulin and doubly deuterated glucose in type 2 diabetic subjects. And after three hours, that's about this time, here, after three hours, um, we had, had some evidence of um, an equilibrium, a stable situation. And then we in, gave the subjects uh, randomly a drink containing either carbon-13 enriched isomaltulose or sucrose. So the label was in the glucose position, in the C1 glucose position of the disaccharide. And then blood and breath samples were collected in parallel prior to and following ingestion 
uh, according to a time sampling procedure. I should point out that, coming back, I should point out that uh, the time interval was quite short. It's about 15 minutes. Maybe you can read it here. And this um, gives you the possibility to also um, fit the data according or model the data according to polynomial equations. So sometimes this is necessary. necessary. And uh, there are some very smart um, approaches here that also take the shape of the glucose curves in consideration. There's, with these kind of experiments here, there's always some assumptions. So one of the assumptions we had here was to reach a steady state of the tracer tracy ratio at approximately 2.1%. So we wanted to enrich all the labeled substances by at least 2%. Um, another important um, assumption is that we did not use the, um, the known uh, defronso protocol of insulin effusion. If you want to focus on the liver, on the glucose flux, flux over the liver, you need to have, you need to work with low insulin levels. So we decided to have a, a insulin infusion rate um, lower than one milliunit per kilogram a minute, and that gives us insulin concentrations that you will later see about 300, uh, 350 picomole per liter and not the high concentrations that you have with a so-called gold standard of hyperinsulinemic clamp. Now after the starting the um, insulin infusion, um, the subject received one gram per kilogram body weight of isomaltulose and sucrose. And you will later see how we calculated this. This is the classical Isotope, isotope dilution principle scheme, and you always see these kind of schemes when, when you're working with a non-steady state compartment model. Um, here on the left-hand side, uh, it's this, the simple effect of the water glass um, that a tracer is administered at a constant rate to follow a trace in a body pool and the atomic mass of the stable isotope tracer will not change, including that which is metabolized, which is also one of the assumptions. Thus, a known amount of tracer and its dilution in the pool will allow to calculate the size of the pool. This is actually the steady state, a very simple equation that you can use here. So you need the infusion rate, it needs to be constant, and you need to measure your tracer in the blood. And then you reach a plateau and then you're happy because now you have reached the equilibrium. If you work with a post under postprandial conditions, you, of course you don't have an equilibrium. And so on the right hand side, you see what happened during the 70s when Steele first time uh, um, published this kind of uh, approach. That was in 1974. Um, so this is actually the steel equation, the first part. The second part is, um, or oh, this is the, the equilibrium part. This is the steel equation. And here we have the Mari equation. This is another extension saying that there is a structural component in your uh, changing compartment. You, you think about two compartments. This is the accessible compartments where you do all your measurements. And this is the non-accessible compartment that you want to identify. And here you have the rate constants, and um, there's also another addition that, that has developed uh, over the years, and that is that you fill your deuterated glucose infusion with, um, also with um, a, a variable uh, um, uh, administration of deuterated glucose, not a constant administration, and that is the red, this is the red RA of T. So what I show you here is how to calculate the total rate of appearance of glucose under the conditions of labeled glucose. And um, from the different parameters you, say, you saw before, you see that actually the total rate of 
appearance is the most complex parameter. And the other complex parameter is the oral um, uptake of glucose. And you can calculate everything else uh, by using simple equations um, when you have, after you have calculated the total rate of uh, appearance. So this is the method, methods part, but actually it's important because this method has so many, uh, you have to estimate so many things before you start all the experiments. And now this is the, the part of the patient. So here you see the basal characteristics um, of the patients. Nothing special. The, these are quite, uh, quite acceptably, um, uh, the, the blood sugar is uh, acceptable. These patients were on diet. They had metformin. So it's quite OK. You, you know these, these kind of patients. They, they are used for metabolic studies. Um, and um, this is uh, the first results. Here you can see what happened when we applied the uh, insulin infusion. And what you can see first is that the glucose levels go down. Uh, and plasma glucose concentrations were similar at baseline before the uh, decelerate load started. And we see what has been also, what you can expect from the previous uh, publications, that sucrose gives a peak and isomaltulose gives a smaller peak here, and there's a difference of about 40, 45%. And also the insulin levels show that there is an increase in insulin level with the, with the insulin infusion, and there is no rise with the isomaltulose, but there is a rise of insulin with um, sucrose. So actually, the basal insulin levels were increased 3.5-fold prior to the administration of the Gisarite drink. And uh, we believe that we reached a steady state here, which I can show you later when the glucose infusion rate is demonstrated. And this is the pattern of hormones that should show you that there is a difference between the two sugars, but um, we need to be careful with the absolute values because the hormones, for instance, C-peptide, but also especially glucagon, was measured uh, under the conditions of the hyperinsulinemic clamp, and we've, we think that the, the ratios, for instance, the insulin-glucagon ratio, is probably more important than the absolute value of glucagon. But what you can see here is mostly isomaltulose results in lower hormone levels, uh, except the GLP-1, where it is the other way around. And here you see the uh, breath 13 carbon dioxide excretion as an indicator for substrate oxidation. Um, you see a slow peak uh, of the isomaltulose curve, and uh, you see a, a quick peak here, uh, and you see a difference of the peak time of about 75 minutes. And on the right-hand side, you see the glucose infusion rates. These are the uh, Actually, what you change while you do the experiment, while you they're in the running experiment, this is what you, uh, when you have your experiment in your hands, uh, they continuously increase during the insulin infusion, reaching nearly identical peak levels before and three hours after the carbohydrate loads. And this also suggests that an equilibrated maximum was attained shortly before uh, ingestion of the sugar drinks. Now this is my, actually my essential slide. The, uh, here you see the most of the calculated data. Um, in the lower left panel shows the oral glucose rates of appearance, which also increased significantly with a fast peak after intake of sucrose. As expected, overall values of oral rates of glucose appearance were lower after ingestion of isomaltulose as opposed to sucrose, and accordingly, about 25% lesser glucose amount derived from isomaltulose reached the system. And then another important factor is the endogenous glucose production. Uh, they were comparable in all subjects prior to carbohydrate ingestion, 
at about eight micromole per kilogram a minute, which is quite good under insulin infusion conditions. And the calculated total mass of endogenous glucose production during four hours was about 20 gram for isomaltulose and about 40 gram for saccharose. That means that glucose production was nearly doubled after intake of sucrose compared with isomaltulose. So in conclusion, this gives you sort of an overview, but we must look at the three important factors that affect from uh, our conclusion of this project. The mag most, ma uh, mostly affect the magnitude of postprandial glucose excursions, and that is the rate of glucose appearance here. And that is the endogenous or hepatic glucose release as you see here. And uh, third is the initial splanchnic glucose uptake. These are the parameters that were, that were most changed in our, uh, under our conditions. Um, okay, so this is my final slide. Um, I want to acknowledge Mai Diang. Uh, she, uh, Mai Diang is my uh, uh, Doc, uh, doctorate student, she will have her thesis in a couple of weeks, and she received uh, a prize from the German uh, Society of Nutrition a couple of uh, weeks ago. And she did, uh, she was, uh, she's very good at doing the calculations <laughs> and understanding the, the equations. Then there's uh, different labs that we work with to measure the stable isotopes. And also there's isotope labeling teams that uh, I acknowledge their continuous support. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, say thank you uh, to Dr. Stephen Piper and Dr. Kendall for including me in the program. Um, what I would uh, just go through my disclosures quickly here so you can see that uh, I've had three companies that I've worked with um, and also received uh, some honorarium and travel expenses have been covered by these. And I am an employee of the University of Calgary. Uh, to mitigate any bias, the work that I'm presenting here today has largely been funded by our peer-reviewed National Health Agency and also a charitable foundation um, from Alberta. Um, the work is also derived from peer-reviewed publications. There is one exception to that. Uh, there's one study that we've performed in children that I want to just briefly highlight a few findings from, and this work was presented at the recent Experimental Biology Conference in Boston. So by way of introduction, I want to just very briefly mention gut microbiota and the link to insulin resistance and uh, type 2 diabetes. And as we can see, the interest in gut microbiota has um, flourished over the past decade. And we know that um, certainly scientists, as you know, highlighted by the Nature Special Edition completely on gut, gut microbiota, there has been uh, an exponential increase in the number of publications that are dealing with gut microbiota and their link to metabolic disease. But we also have the general public who is being exposed to this concept of gut microbiota and what the implication might be for their own health. And so we see just one from ABC News out of the United States, so anxiety in your head could come from your gut. And the number of conditions and diseases that have been linked to gut microbiota is, is increasing, and our understanding is increasing. So just very briefly to start with the concept of how did we link gut microbiota to metabolism. Um, we've also uh, heard previously, so Jeff Gordon had uh, some postdoctoral fellows working in his lab just approximately a decade ago who really laid some foundational work in the whole concept of gut microbiota linking to metabolism. 
And so what one of the postdocs did, Frederick Backhead, he took conventionally raised mice um, and he transplanted or took the gut microbiota from these animals and transplanted it into a germ-free animal who had lived its entire life uh, completely free from any bacterial contact. And very rapidly what they saw was that there was an increase in adipose tissues in these animals that had previously been germ-free but now were colonized with gut microbiota. Um, and what they saw was that these animals were now able to harvest more energy from the diet that they were consuming, and they were also able to identify very specific um, pathways that are involved in energy storage. And so we, we could now see that gut microbiota um, play a role in energy metabolism and in energy balance. Um, in, in the same lab, uh, Dr. Gordon also had another postdoctoral fellow who then went on to link the gut microbiota to obesity itself. And so what the initial findings or um, observations were that if you have uh, genetically lean and obese mice, there's a very distinct profile between these two phenotypes or genotypes uh, in these animals. And at that time, the, the major finding was at the phylum level. And what we saw was that in the obese animals, there was an increase in the firmicutes phylum and a decrease in the Bacteroidetes. Um, they then also looked, does this uh, apply to what we see in common obesity in, in humans? And indeed it was. Um, they saw that obese humans display an altered microbial profile and that this microbial profile could actually be changed if those individuals were put on a diet and lost weight. And so what we now know is that this uh, profile, this obese profile for the microbiota is much more complex than um, just changes at the phylum level. And so some of um, the, we're getting deeper and deeper into our understanding of what really constitutes um, uh, a microbiota profi profile that is, as we call it, dysbiotic or in uh, no longer a healthy balance. And so then finally, um, another group uh, in Belgium, um, the Kenai and Delsen group, really were looking for a causative agent. So what is it about the gut microbiota that might be linking them to metabolic disease and then uh, triggering type two, uh, type 2 diabetes? And what they found was that there is a specific component um, the cell wall component of gram-negative bacteria called lipopolysaccharide. And this was identified to be an inflammatory trigger for insulin resistance and then subsequent di um, diabetes. And so what they coined the term metabolic endotoxemia. So you have a leaky gut, whereas normally the uh, barrier, the gut barrier is very well, uh, has good integrity and is tight. When you feed a high fat, this is lard, and a high fat, high sugar diet, you compromise that barrier. And those endotoxin, the lipopolysaccharide from the bacteria is able to translocate into the circulation and then can trigger the insulin uh, resistance. And the interesting thing is that certain uh, bacterial groups uh, are more protective uh, and some are certainly more uh, harmful. So they saw that bifidobacterium was negatively correlated with the endotoxemia. So if you could increase the abundance of the bifidobacteria, you could create a better barrier in the gut and reduce this um, translocation of the LPS into um, the intestine. So with this background of the importance of gut microbiota into metabolic disease, then of course the $6 million question becomes, if we know there's dysbiosis, a, a, disturbance in the microbiota profile, is there a way to bring it back to what we hope to one day identify as a healthy profile? It's difficult to, to know exactly what a healthy profile is, but is there something we can do dietary-wise to, to do that? And of course, prebiotics um, fit that bill um, for several reasons, and they're actually defined as a selectively fermented ingredient that can then change the composition or the activity of the, the gut microbiota. And the key thing is that then it will confer a health benefit onto the host. And so we can get prebiotic from you know, certain low levels from foods we consume. Um, but in essence, the vast majority of the studies that have been performed with prebiotic 
are looking at it in supplemental form. So it's difficult to get sufficient amounts from the, the diet, just eating those foods, to really get a, a therapeutic effect here. So we've done a lot of work in uh, rodent models, some of those with pregnancy, which would be really uh, interesting and relevant for a talk on gestational diabetes. But today what I'd like to do is really focus in on the, the human clinical evidence that we have for the health benefits of prebiotic fiber. And um, uh, another day we could uh, talk about some of the really interesting other work that is being done with uh, prebiotics. So what I'd like to do, there, there's some classical or really well-established effects of the prebiotics, some of the first effects that were looked at. And that's really in terms of energy intake. So satiety, your, your feeling, your appetite feelings, and the gut hormones. And then uh, certainly following with that is weight loss. But there's some other metabolic benefits that probably haven't received quite as much attention. And for that, I'd like to focus in on glycemia, lipid metabolism, and then inflammation. So just to uh, give you two brief examples of the effect of prebiotic fiber on appetite, um, this is a study we did six years ago. And here we gave a, a fairly high dose of prebiotic. We used oligofructose here at 21 grams per day. And what we saw was that over the three months that the individuals either consumed the prebiotic or the placebo, the control, was that they self-reported, and again, we, we've heard about the problems with self-reporting, but we did do a weighed three-day food record in these individuals repeatedly. And as you can see, the bottom line represents those that had consumed the oligofructose. And so compared to their baseline, they report consuming less energy throughout the study. And at the six-week time point, it was actually significantly uh, lower than what the placebo group was um, doing. And so what could be some of the mechanisms? And there's been a, a, a big body of literature that has looked at the appetite hormones, the gut hormones. And in this study, we saw that there was increased PYY in these individuals and decreased ghrelin or the hunger hormone. Um, the group of Delsen and, and Kenai, they looked at the subjective ratings of appetite. And here they used a, a bit lower dose. It was 16 grams per day. And so this was in healthy individuals. I should just mention that um, our study was in overweight and obese adults. This one was with healthy adults. And when they gave the oligofructose for two weeks, what they saw was following a breakfast that those who had consumed the oligofructose had a much higher rating of their satiety. And they followed them throughout the day, and by the time the dinner meal came, they also saw that these subjects were still reporting higher satiety, lower hunger, and when you ask the subjects, how much do you think you could eat, their prospective food consumption, these individuals were saying, I could eat less compared to those who were given the placebo. So if we can control or manage our appetite, more effectively, does that have any effect on weight loss is, is the key question. And so again, I'll just present from our study with the overweight and obese adults that um, indeed we see a significant decrease in body weight. The majority of that weight is coming from fat mass. And in animal studies, it's very interesting. We've seen almost this selective uh, reduction adiposity and lean mass is beautifully preserved in, in animal models. And, and here we see, again, that the majority of that weight loss is from fat mass and a good portion from trunk fat. Now, I'll just highlight that the placebo group actually gained a small amount of weight during this time. And this is very typical um, that if you, um, you know, I liked Dr. Tim Church's analogy where he said that in his subjects, if you do nothing, they will not be level, the type 2 diabetes. They will continue to deteriorate. And the same thing we see with body weight. If you do nothing, individuals, adults, will typically gain approximately one kilogram per year. And we, we saw that very nicely in our study in the placebo group. So the prebiotic could stop that gradual adult weight gain and, and cause a bit of reduction uh, in weight and certainly in, in the fat mass. So even though small um, magnitude, probably important in halting weight gain. So here's where I just want to highlight what we've seen in children, because there's been very little work um, looking at overweight and obese children with prebiotic. And so we were very interested to know, does this have an impact on their uh, body fat? And what we see is that the placebo, these, these children continue to grow. They continue to gain weight. 
Um, so this was over four months that we followed them. We gave them a fairly low dose. For, for children, it was eight grams per day that we gave them. And what you can see is that the change in total body weight was significantly reduced in the children who got the prebiotic. Um, and importantly, we see that this was um, a, a good reduction in their central or their trunk fat. So if we go to the metabolic e effects, first let's go to glycemia. And um, there's been a really nice systematic review meta-analysis uh, that was published last year in 2014. And here you can see we have four studies that met the uh, criteria for inclusion to look at glycemia. And what we see is that uh, the standardized mean difference uh, favored the prebiotics, so the postprandial glucose concentrations were reduced with prebiotics, so negative 0.76. And um, if we then also look at the insulinemia, uh, three studies were included here, and a uh, very similar outcome that the postprandial insulin concentrations are also reduced. Now, it, it's important to note that in this meta-analysis, there were no changes in the fasting glucose or the fasting insulin, therefore HOMA-IR was not different, and they didn't see any changes in the hemoglobin A1C. But certainly postprandially, uh, the glucose and the insulin, uh, we have fairly robust data to say it is reduced. So then if we look at, uh, move on to lipid metabolism, uh, you can see that there's quite a few more studies that have actually looked at lipid metabolism and prebiotic intake. And importantly, these studies that are listed here, they include healthy individuals, they include overweight individuals, and there's some studies in there with hypercholesterolemic individuals. Um, and I've just uh, pulled out the triglycerides. Um, Valium, there was really, really no change here, so the um, standardized mean difference was negative 0.11, but this was not significant for triglycerides. Um, and they also were not able to detect a change for total or LDL cholesterol. One interesting thing is that uh, when you look through the studies with the lipid profile, most of those use a, a relatively lower dose of the prebiotic. So a lot of these use 8 to 10 grams of prebiotic in their interventions, whereas the studies that I've presented for satiety, uh, weight loss, whatnot, those are typically higher with 15 to 20. We did 21 grams. So maybe a bit of difference there with the dose in, in the outcomes. And so then finally, I just want to briefly mention a couple things about inflammation. And certainly inflammation is, is um, getting its uh, time in the spotlight. And there's been calls, uh, this is just a Nature Reviews, where they're saying that maybe it's time to look more closely at uh, targeting inflammation and looking at how can we treat inflammation in metabolic disease and type 2 diabetes. And so from the studies that have per been performed with um, prebiotic fiber, we see for C-reactive protein, three out of the four studies have shown a significant reduction. Uh, these have been in obese adults, and there was one study, uh, women with type 2 diabetes. For TNF-alpha and IL-6, the, the this kind of uh, contradictory results amongst the studies that have been published. And then plasma LPS, remember that the bacterial endotoxin that can translocate into the system and trigger um, insulin resistance. So here there's been two studies. Uh, they both saw a significant reduction, one in healthy adults and then one in the women with type 2 diabetes. Um, we then went back um, to our study with the 21 grams of oligofructose in overweight and obese adults, and we looked at uh, the, the cytokine profile, inflammatory marker profile in these individuals, and what we see was also confirming a significant decrease in LPS levels compared to the placebo who had a slight increase. And then um, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1 is a coagulation factor. And what we saw was that there was a significantly greater decrease in the prebiotic individuals compared to those who had received the uh, control. And then finally, um, just again briefly, what, what happens in children? These, these children were overweight and obese. Their percent body fat uh, was 42%. So these are, are children who um, uh, metabolically are very unhealthy. And what we could see was that there was a slight increase in IL-6 in the children in the control group and a significant decrease in IL-6 levels in uh, the children with the prebiotic intake. And then CRP, you kind of see the same pattern, but that wasn't uh, significant. So in conclusion, uh, there's very good evidence that prebiotic fiber enhances satiety. Um, the individual studies have been able to show weight reduction, body fat production, but if you do the meta-analysis, those did not come out as significant.
Um, prebiotic fiber also reduces postprandial glucose and insulin. Um, however, there weren't changes for some of the other indicators of glucose control. And finally, prebiotic fiber is a potential target for inflammation, and I think we're going to see more work in this area, and the evidence is accumulating for that. So thank you. Right, I'm going to talk about achieving a low glycemic response diet within a food-based approach to healthy eating. The presentation is going to be mostly men analytical reviews that I'm looking at, and the financial support is from BNO. BNO do produce quite a number. Vino do produce quite a number of, of carbohydrate ingredients, uh, so there's some in interest there. The things which we, uh, which the people who have co uh, covered us in the past are, are very varied, very, very numerous over the last five years. And one thing I should say, and without having to read them all out, is that many of them are, are interested in ingredients. We have a policy at InLogic that we do good science. Of course, all science is good. Um, if it's not good, it's not really science. But it stands alone in a part irrespective of the funding, funding source. That's one of the principles we work on. And therefore, we hope not to uh, confuse uh, and mislead the general public in any of the work that we do and uh, endeavor to uh, approach that. So I'm going to be speaking quite a lot about uh, food-based advice and how to achieve a low glycemic index diet. And it's really quite important that we don't really speak about just a low glycemic index diet as, as being a, a, sort, a, a sort of diet. There are many types of diet that can be low glycemic index. But what very often national food authorities will do is that they will say things like um, eat five a day fruit and veg or more than that or various other foods. And the question is whether these are optimal for our health. Of course, the idea of giving that device is that it's optimal for health. So what we'll be doing is having a look at some of the um, food-based advice and asking if it is optimal for type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. I'll give you what my thinking is, but there's still a question mark there. I want to look at another component to say, well, if it's not just food-based advice, should be looking at components of foods. And I look, want to look there at the protein content of the diet. Is that important? And I think I'll be suggesting yes, but this question mark. Is there a role for novel carbohydrates and, and prebiotics, examples of isomaltulose and inulin? And I think there, again, the answer is going to be yes, but again, there's a question mark. And is there evidence of effectiveness across the continuum from healthy individuals to uh, those who are already, uh, say, diabetic or already have heart disease? And I think, again, the answer is going to be yes, there is. But again, there's still a question mark. So turning now to glycemic index um, is not needed. This is often uh, a, a comment that, that I hear, because if you have healthy food, uh, then you, you'll be eating a low glycemic index food. So I decided that I'd really have a look at this and see whether it's true or not. And we tend to attach positive messages to some foods and negative messages to others. So is it true or false? Well, some years ago, in 2006, it was already evident to me that, for example, things like fruit and vegetables, uh, particularly legumes and whole grains, um, are the sorts of foods which uh, we want to talk about amongst others, which I'll come to, uh, and that they do in fact have some differences, but they're only small differences compared to the very wide range of glycemic indices that you can get for these particular foods. Now, if what we do is bring these together, this is called an adjustment, so we can look at the remaining variants after taking account uh, of the differences between the foods. And instead of just looking at these three foods, we can add to them the other ones with a positive message and those with a negative message. Once we've done that, then we come up 
uh, with about 700 foods there. And quite surprisingly, uh, they all seem to fit a rather similar curve. But the most important point to note is that after adjusting for those, there's still a very large variation in the foods. Well, that's all well and good. But it's great for those who want to design, as David Jenkins once did do, uh, particularly with fruits, to say, well, does it matter whether you consume a low glycemic index fruit or a high glycemic index fruit? And his studies uh, for Marcus in diabetes suggested that, that it did matter. But are these differences real for all, all the other things? For that, we can only re start to look at an, analysis, at an analysis of the variants. And for our information, we take from the uh, international food tables for our GFI, GI values, but there's also information there on the variants of those determinations. So that's with determination within, within the laboratory. And of course, there's variation between laboratories or among laboratories and there's variation among, among, among the foods. And what we really want to get at is this variation among foods. And we can express this as a residual heter heterogeneity, which is called I squared. And when we do that for glycemic index, we, first of all, if we have, if in model zero there, we have no food groups which we uh, say is predicting uh, a difference in glycemic index, uh, then we find that 80% of the variance uh, in the GI values in the tables for these 700 foods is, is unrelated, sorry, is, is related to the differences in the foods. If now we try to explain that by adding fruit groups, for example, fruit and vegetables, that's the very simplest, the very simplest model that people generally get to hear of, and it's the most common one that, that we hear of, and that's without necessarily making a difference between the types of vegetables, which most, uh, most people don't know about. It actually makes no difference to explaining the heterogeneity amongst these foods. We can add now starchy vegetables to make a di distinction in the model between uh, low starchy vegetables and high starchy vegetables, and it made no difference. Now, whole grains is really quite important, we hear, but again, it makes very little difference. When you start adding other things like low fiber cereals, legumes, and dairy, then you get uh, an influence. And for adding further things such as uh, vegetables, uh, where you start differentiating the colors as they do in the states, um, then there's very little, very little carbohydrate uh, in those, and it's going to make very little difference. Now that's the glycemic index. So it doesn't look like the uh, food-based models are going to tell us much about changing the glycemic index. Here we now have for the glycemic load, and look at it, 96% gets improved, as for, and the best models down to 86%. So I think the overall conclusion I've got from that is that these, the models that we have for food-based advice given out by national authorities are not really telling us much about the glycemic index of the foods. And so we need to add something to what is already being done. And that has to be uh, some element of uh, glycemic index or glycemic load or glycemic response, whichever uh, is found appropriate for circumstances. I want to look at other things now, like protein. So already we've got these uh, glycemic index, glycemic load, etc., which is rather different sort of information, useful information, additional to food-based advice. What we do in epidemiological studies very often is, is we'll split up the uh, population that we've sampled into, say, uh, there's five cohorts, and we'll express the uh, relative risk. You know, there's a risk in a specific cohort over some reference cohort, which might be the lowest or the highest uh, cohort uh, highest, uh, uh, cohort with the highest or lowest risk. And what, what we use this uh, relative risk for um, is that in the lower value tends to normalize for an unspecified range of regional factors and confounders, uh, which sometimes uh, we at attempt to uh, correct for. But if we're mixing studies from different regions, and all <coughs> these factors are still uh, hindering our attempt to assess what, the diff what impact they will have. And so we can now go to a pool cohort. So we don't pull data from studies, we pull, we'll just pull all the cohorts and re-express the relative uh, risk as being the cohort from the lowest or the highest risk within all the cohorts that eggs happen. And we can do this now for uh, glycemic index and, and, glyce and uh, protein, or I should say the protein energy ratio. <laughs> and when we do this, we come to what is, for me, some rather astounding findings that uh, globally, uh, the relative risk is really quite large. We're used to speaking of, of relative risk changes of 1.2 or 
1.3, 1.4, perhaps 1.6. But here we're talking of potentially globally of tenfold for type 2 diabetes um, or higher for uh, coronary heart disease. Now I should express here why we have this determinant in its particular form, which is glycemic index multiplied by the uh, inverse of protein energy ratio. And it's simply the glycemic index, as it nice increases, is a positive relationship with risk, whereas the protein is a negative relationship with risk, and we can't have it pushing in different directions. We've really got to put the two together, forcing in the same direction. And this doesn't necessarily say that it's the protein or the energy that's a, that's a critical issue, but, but there's some interaction between glycemic index and some other part of the diet, which is either protein, energy, it might be uh, even that there's a, uh, an interaction between glycemic index and, and dietary fat as well as the carbohydrate that's present. So that's quite interesting, and I'm looking forward in the future to um, expanding upon that. If I can move on now to uh, other things, well, this is the one we did a little while ago, saying uh, here we are, up to 1.8 globally for our glycemic load. And something that Simon showed earlier on that I always like to keep showing because an editorial said that um, glycemic load has no significant effect in men. Well, this slide on the right hand side tells you that it does. And that the, there is a sex difference. And if you have a mixed population, then you get intermediate results. I want to speak now to isomodular. So we've got, we've got glycemic index, we've got protein as being components of the diet that we need to think about additional, it seems to me, to uh, food-based advice. We've heard a lot about it. It's low glycemic compared with sucrose. It's only half the glycemic index of sucrose. There are six trials that will uh, that tell us that about 95% or, or more of the isomaltulose is, is absorbed. There are 35 trials telling us that there's a reduced blood glucose response, 25 trials showing a reduced insulin response, six trials showing a reduced fasting triglycerides, and six trials suggesting an elevation in fat oxidation. Um, those with the probabilities are things, are probabilities we've ob observed ourselves from uh, meta-analyses. Meta uh, but I'm, I'm sure there are more studies that we can add. Those were uh, systematically taken from, uh, from uh, Medline and, uh, and Embase. Looking at isomaltulos, um, what we can tell you is that when this is given at, at various doses from 17 up to, up to does this work from 17 up to 50, then there may even be a dose response reduction uh, in, in, fasting, in fasting blood glucose. It isn't large, but it does seem to be well, it's bearing on the significance. But there are not enough studies to, to tell us that there really is a, a, a dose response. There's an effect uh, in, in diabetics, which is in the same direction, possibly a little bit more but not enough yet to tell us that it's significant. But overall, there is a, a, a significant uh, influence. Looking now at the difference in insulin resistance, mostly this is, is over IR uh, for uh, isomaltulose. Um, there's not, not really a lot happening uh, for non-diabetics. Non one study in type 1 diabetes suggesting an effect, uh, and it's rather mixed results for type 2 diabetes. But notice these are, are poorer studies in the sense that they're uh, much more variable and tell us very little more. But overall, there's a significant effect. And if we combine the whole, even if we combine the whole lot, there's a significant uh, reduction uh, in, in HOMA score. Turning now to fructans, and I'm looking at inion oligofructose and fructo oligosaccharides, I'm not differentiating between those uh, so we can keep uh, sufficient numbers of observations. Uh, here, if we replace a carbon <coughs> and available <coughs> carbohydrate with, with, with any of these fructans, <coughs> then we don't really see any, any improvement uh, in the fasting blood glucose amongst individuals who are non-diabetic. There's a range of different metabolic states, some of them healthy, but um, the overall <coughs> picture is there's not a lot going on there. But once you get to the uh, type 2 diabetics, then you do find an effect. And it is noticeable that those with the largest effect are those with the greatest uh, severity of diabetes, which is something that we've found before. So it does look like that there is a, a, a role for uh, the novel carbohydrates and the, uh, and the prebiotics. If we go one step further uh, on that last point, that, uh, there is even with individual studies here, you can see that there's the change in fasting blood glucose does depend on the severity of their diabetes. We can see that in some cases, 
Um, if we look at all our studies together, there are 20, 23 normal, 23 in total, and six which are in, in, in diabetes. But all studies together, um, there's a relationship with <coughs> increased in blood glucose, that then, then the effect gets, gets bigger. The negative there tells us that the blood glucose is going down. You get the uh, effect with prebiotics and those which are only prebiotics, but also with symbiotics, uh, where the uh, fructan is provided with various microorganisms. Uh, of course, there are only a few numbers of studies, studies there. Uh, so it does look, hint at the, 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 one of the possible effects of the, of the uh, fructans is to support microorganisms in the gut, but that's, that's only suggestive. <laughs> I've shown this figure here, this is the determinant, if you like, fasting blood glucose minus five, which is about normal. If you square it, then you get uh, a reduction in the heterogeneity, which tells us really that, that this relationship is not linear, that it's, that it's curvilinear. And that, and that uh, there are other ways, and we do know that remaining variants, you can remove some of that by an even better modeling of those relationships. Okay, treatment with fructans, uh, with, now we're looking at insulin resistance amongst all these studies. Uh, it does seem that there is some improvement in, in uh, insulin resistance, that it decreases both in non-diabetics and, and in diabetics. The influence in diabetics does seem to be uh, rather variable in individual studies and doesn't turn out to be significant individually, but is bearing on the age of significance uh, when, when we start combining studies. But there are only two studies there, and it would be nice for us to see more of those. And my last point is that, um, is that I do feel um, that in addition to uh, GI protein, some of these novel carbohydrates and prebiotics being uh, either especially helpful or, or, or marginally helpful, uh, that um, although we see nothing happening down here when blood glucose is, is having, it, it is very low. Can't get this one to move on. Oh, there we go. When blood glucose is very low, this is a range from um, non-diabetics up to severely diabetic individuals showing that uh, glycemic index will, will lower the blood glucose response and that it's a great, greater absolute reduction uh, in those with greater absolute severity of, of the disease. But that happens as we get older. And the way I look at it is this, that if you're diabetic, you can, you can get uh, some improvement and demonstrate it. And if you're non-diabetic, you hope that the future in your life, as it gets, uh, you, you stop yourself getting worse and you never ever see an effect with these things. But that doesn't mean to say they're having no effect whatsoever in the body. It's just that you can never pick it up easily. And that you need to have long-term long studies if you want, want to do that. Now, I'm going to say finally on this one, I'm going back to the slide that I had. You've seen it before. There are question marks on it and we've done something to help remove some of, those, some of those question marks. So that's the direction which I think all this is leading. <coughs> and finally, I would like to thank all these people who have been support, encouraging, very supportive, even if it's just a one-word answer, to, like yes, to a question. Uh, sometimes a yes means that they're letting, letting themselves in for a lot of work. Um, quite a number of people who have been very helpful, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to have had their, their support. And um, that's the end, sorry folks, um, but thank you very much for uh, lending me your ears and being attentive. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, want to, uh, well, there's the title of the talk. I want to thank my, uh, my co-authors who aren't here today, and particularly those from the University of Groningen, uh, who were critical to the last study that I'll be talking about. Uh, thank you for the organizers also for giving me 10 minutes rather than six. <laughs> That's the disclosure. Uh, Unilever paid for it. Unilever paid for me. Um, but the research was carried out by groups independent of Unilever, and I think the only thing that's actually important on here, and actually something which I believe should be an oath 
uh, signed by all researchers prior to submitting any uh, nutrition intervention studies to journals are these two points here, the primary and secondary outcomes, the statistical analyses and criteria were all pre-specified in protocols, and the per-protocol analyses were done under a blind uh, review. Uh, the background to this uh, uh, and the reason we were interested in this is that uh, flatbreads are a carbohydrate-rich staple, uh, which is an important source of glycemic exposures in, in many Southeast Asian populations. People have looked at alternative starch sources and relatively high addition to fibers uh, to these and found they can have some efficacy for lowering postprandial glycemia and insulinemia. Um, but in addition to finding what else, what might actually be efficacious, I think there's a, a really big issue, and it's come up in a few of the talks here, uh, that when you add these kinds of substantial amounts of viscous fibers or perhaps resistant starches, there are impacts on product quality and acceptance. So finding products, finding what you can add that actually doesn't adversely affect the preparation quality, so in this case it's dough preparation, it's a mix that's, uh, that people prepare at home, the sensory attributes, and especially cost for these populations, I think is, is critical for, for making these feasible. Uh, we looked at uh, predictions from in vitro, but we also wanted to know what is the mode of action? Why do these things have these effects? Uh, so the objectives are here, and uh, really it was focused around what's called, a, it's a wheat-based flour, and, and in India it's called atta, and it's a, as I say, it's a flour that people use for preparing flatbreads at home. In this case, chapatis. Um, I'll take you through quickly, uh, and the details, of course, are in the abstract, uh, through the trials, but for all of these trials, all trials, uh, there was a randomized allocation to treatments. These were all with healthy, non-obese adults, um, double-blind, uh, all used within subject, either a complete or incomplete balanced design. And in all of the studies, subjects were getting three chapatis, so it was 100 grams of flour. Uh, and as you'll see, it was about 55 to 60 grams of, of available carbohydrate. We started out by identifying candidate ingredients from the uh, literature and then carried out an exploratory trial, which was only looking at postprandial glycemia. This was done in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, well, uh, incomplete block design, so we used a lot of formulations, and we can be quite creative with incomplete block designs, but each subject only got the control and four other uh, formulations. And this was, and it turns out to be important, I'll come back to the point, it was using uh, capillary uh, blood. This is in, your, uh, is in the abstract, I'm not going to go through the list, but it was various combinations using different levels of a high viscosity, uh, a high molecular weight uh, guar gum, different additions or combinations with chickpea uh, flour and also uh, a couple of additions of konjac uh, man and konjac uh, gum. Um, the market standard atta was included. Now this is a typical product that people would buy. It's milled. It's typically had most of the fiber removed from it. Also, uh, people can buy a high fiber atta where they've added back those fibers and that was our reference. So all of these treatments are compared to this control which can be considered a standard product with some fibers added back. So out of all those, this is the results of that first study, and you can see that four of the uh, treatments clearly not only had a statistically significant effect, but really quite a sizable uh, magnitude of effect on reducing postprandial uh, glycemia. This is the incremental, positive incremental area under the curve uh, for two hours, uh, with reductions of over 30% in, uh, in that two-hour AUC. And these were combinations of 2 or 4% guar gum with chickpea uh, flour, 6% six, uh, 6 guar gum alone, or 4% konjac uh, alone. Uh, we also measured satiety. We saw no effect. That was an exploratory uh, uh, measure. Uh, those results were reasonably, actually, in, in, at first glance, astoundingly well uh, predicted by, uh, by in vitro parameters from English type methods and so looking at the parameters, the rate of digestion, the area under the release curve, and the, con and the uh, 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 concentration of carbohydrate, the amount of carbohydrate. Um, later, I was informed uh, that actually the statistician had removed a point, so uh, there was actually an outlier, and the relationship is, is somewhat uh, lower when that outlier was, uh, was included. Uh, the second study, then, uh, we did in India, so this is more of a confirmatory trial with a, the typical population consuming these, where we looked at uh, postprandial glycemia and insulin uh, levels. In between, we selected from the ones that were effective here and tried to optimize those formulations. 
Um, now, one of the problems, I don't know if anybody's ever consumed a product that had 4% konjac menin or 6% or, uh, guargam in it. Uh, there's somebody there, she's laughing because um, consumers don't laugh. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not very nice, actually. So um, it's not really practicable. Um, there, were, there were problems with it in terms of, of viscosity and cost. And also, we wanted to minimize the amount of guargam. And what we had discovered along the way was surprisingly adding, surprisingly, as they say in patent filings, uh, when you add small amounts of barley flour uh, to this, you can control an off aroma associated with guargum. So there's small amounts of barley flour added. So we took the control from the previous study. We took what we consider to be a positive control from the, perfect, from the previous study, something which was clearly effective, and then had two other trials, one, two other uh, treatments, one using two or three percent guargum with small additions, uh, which we don't think are really effective for, for, for these outcome measures, but do help with the um, uh, sensory attributes, small amounts of barley flour. Uh, and in this study, as I said, we looked at PPG, also PPI, but used venous uh, blood. And the results are here. This is the, the top here is for, uh, for, for, for glucose. And what you can see is, again, we have uh, certainly for two of the treatments, clearly significant. For all three of the treatments, quite reasonable reductions in postprandial glycemia. But, and I don't know if Alfred Aziz is here, but I hope he's listening, substantially smaller effect sizes when you use venous blood rather than uh, capillary blood. And that's a consistent observation that people have uh, in these kinds of studies. So I think that's an effect of the collection method rather than a difference between populations, uh, and quite uh, substantial and consistently uh, large uh, reductions and, and statistically significant reductions in postprandial insulinemia with all three of these uh, treatments. And again, satiety was included, and uh, there's no effect on this. And in fact, we never see in many, many studies an effect of variation in postprandial glycemia per se on satiety. Uh, so then we selected from these, and the final study was to look at uh, flux, and I'm pleased that, uh, uh, the, that uh, Professor Lin uh, introduced this concept to start with. Um, it's been spoken about a few times here, which is that postprandial glycemic curves cannot confirm rates of digestion or uptake. It's often an assumption uh, which is made uh, because the glycemic response is, an, is a re result of hepatic production influx from the flu food, in this case uh, chapatis, and disposal uh, into uh, tissues. And one can look at this by labeling uh, the food, uh, giving an infusion of tracer amounts uh, of, uh, in this case, 13C for the influx, deuterated glucose for disposal, and you can make some calculations here. Um, and this is what we wanted to do uh, in this study, which was to, to uh, which was the primary outcome was to, the primary uh, outcome measure was to look at the effect on the rates of uptake. So was the addition of this, uh, uh, of this alternative starch source and a viscous fiber, was it really affecting and substantially affecting the rates of uptake in uh, appearance? Again, the same control product, the same positive control, and one of the uh, optimized products, so 2% guar gum, 3% uh, uh, barley. Primary outcome was time to 50% absorption. Uh, we grew wheat in 13 CO conditions uh, to, uh, to get the tracer. We gave a bolus, as I mentioned, of deuterated um, uh, glucose for disposal um, and collected blood over uh, six hours. Um, and first of all, just to be sure, we can reproduce the effects of these on reducing postprandial glycemia. So that's the two-hour AUC for glucose. That's the two-hour AUC for insulin. So the things are still effective for reducing postprandial uh, glycemia and insulinemia. But, and rather surprisingly for us, there's clearly, I mean, you don't need to look at the statistical significance, there's clearly a trivial uh, effect on the rates of, of on the time to 50% absorption uh, of uh, uptake of glucose from these products. The rates of, and that's consistent with the rates of appearance, uh, which are, which are differing, which are trivially different. This, these weren't uh, for planned for statistical analyses, but you can see the 95% confidence intervals. Rate of disposal, also very, very little effect on rates of disposal, and if anything, in the wrong direction, quote unquote. Uh, 
but quite a substantial effect on the rates of endogenous uh, glucose production, where uh, increasing amounts of, uh, of guar gum was associated with quite substantial reductions, uh, as I say, in the uh, rates of endogenous glucose production. We also looked at uh, GYP and GLP-1. We saw some small reductions uh, in GYP with the, with the guar gum treatments and negligible changes in GLP-1. So to conclude, uh, we did find specific combinations of chickpea flour and guar gum, which could be commercially feasible, and I think that's the important point here, commercially feasible routes uh, to reduce PPG and PPI response to, to in flatbreads. Uh, we feel, and others have said this, that the in vitro assays can be very, very helpful and, and may be given the next, the final point, um, surprisingly uh, uh, helpful in, uh, in predicting uh, the, the effects of these on postprandial glycemia. And surprising, I say, because those assays are actually looking at glucose release, and that's the thing that didn't actually change very much. Uh, in fact, the PPI and PPG lowering effects in this case, we could only find small effects uh, on glucose uptake. Uh, and actually, the bigger effects were coming probably from post-absorptive effects. So that's what we've done. I'll stop there, and uh, thank you. Dr. Reamer, I have two questions. One for Dr. Reamer. Uh, you mentioned that uh, probiotics, prebiotics reduce postprandial glucose. So postprandial after consuming what? What was the test meal, TS meals used? So typically those are oral glucose tolerance tests. So it's a, a glucose load that the uh, individuals, in, in our studies it's been 75 gram glucose. Uh, the study I presented for ours was a, a meal tolerance test. We have switched to oral You showed a, a meta-analysis. Yeah, in the meta-analysis, the postprandial was from oral glucose tolerance and meal tolerance. Both have been included in there. All right, in well, that's studies. rather different. But okay. And uh, Dr. Mel, that was an interesting uh, presentation about the, the kinetics. Uh, you showed that uh, the, chapati, the, the test products reduce glucose production presumably hepatic glucose production. Yes. Relative so does this control. mean that more, the, so the glucose that's being absorbed is going into the liver, not appearing peripherally? Is that, so is, the, is more glucose going into um, the liver? That's possible, Stored? but that would, that would probably, oh, is that on? But any, in any case, I, that would probably show up then in the disposal rates uh, as well, which we didn't see much, uh, much evidence uh, for that. Um, um, because I, I think your I think peripheral, that is that peripheral disposal? That's your only that's, capturing that's what gets into disposal. the periphery, is that right? That's to, no, that's total disposal, total disposal because there's a tracer of deuterated, uh, okay. of, of, uh, deuterated glucose. So that's total disposal. Okay, Fred. Yeah, Fred Brown. So I have a question to Raleen. Uh, in, in, in the beginning of your lecture, you referred to LPS and, uh, and, and uh, leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm not aware of any good data that prove that there is a leaky gut in diabetes. So I'm, I would like to know your comment on that. And uh, yeah, first that, I have one second point. So I think the, the leaky gut certainly has been shown in most clearly in rodent models in terms of uh, dietary challenge with a high fat, high sugar diet. So in an obese model is uh, where you see you give the high fat, high sugar diet, and the gut becomes leaky. And they've shown a decrease in the tight junction proteins and expression and whatnot. I know, I know yeah. but I refer to humans. In humans, uh, that evidence is, I I'm not sure that that's there yet. No, okay. it, it has been established in yeah. the rodent model. The translation, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, one, one other point, and that's also a suggestion. Your title is on prebiotic, <clears throat> but just as fiber, Prebiotic is not equal to prebiotic. There are many types of prebiotic, and major the, the data that you show over on oligofructose, and you, you show two studies, one with 21 gram a day and one yeah. with 16 gram a day, and effects on satiety. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of speculations on the fatty acids there that will have an effect feeding back on satiety. 
My feeling is that this is oligofructose. These are very big dosages. They cause a lot of gas production in the cecum. And we know that this tension of the cecum and also of the colon feeds back and reduces gastric emptying, has an effect on reducing appetite. And, and, and that's why I say, well, prebiotic oligofructose in this case, because we don't see that with slowly fermentable carbohydrates that are also prebiotic. And I would like to know your, 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 your feeling about it. So I, uh, my feeling is this is a gas, a gas production issue rather than a specific prebiotic type. So uh, I don't think there's uh, empirical data to, to look at Physiologically, is it the gas production uh, that is linking to the satiety? But certainly there is uh, some analysis we're working on in, in terms of the association between the two. So the reporting from the subjects of bloating uh, and flatulence and then correlations with satiety. And, and we do see an association between those two. So empirically, though, like, specific physiological data to, to tease that out, I'm, I'm not aware. It's well, associations are, at this they point. Are there. there are yeah. a, a whole range of studies with, uh, with uh, balloon inflation in, okay. the, in the colon uh, that yeah. immediately show that this tension, like you have with gas, uh, reduces uh, gastric emptying and has an effect on, uh, on satiety feeling. So I right. recommend you to look into that. Okay. Andreas Pfeiffer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My, my uh, question is to David Mila. Um, I'm Dan Ramdath from Ag Canada. Um, my question pertains to the, um, the preparation of the, um, the chickpea flour, because we're finding that uh, the postprandial blood glucose response, um, and as well as the in vitro measurements of starch fractions, are largely dependent on uh, the way the, uh, the pulses are processed into flours. Um, I, 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 mean, I could get that information. I don't know it off the top of my head, but in fact, of course, the incorporation of chickpea flour was only 15%, so it wasn't a majority uh, uh, chickpea flour. It wasn't a very high uh, component of chickpea flour in, the, in those products. Andreas Pfeiffer, no. So my first, I have two questions. One goes to David. Um, the hormone you didn't show was glucagon, and actually the incretin changes wouldn't really explain it. So I, do you say there is something I, X, or is it glucagon? I, I you know, the conclusion, I, I'm glad you asked the question, because one of the points that we came to, and it was reinforced by this result, uh, was that glucagon is the hormone to be measuring. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't measure it in that study. Um, <clears throat> going forward, if we look at hormone panels, uh, I have well, we will be measuring it, and I would strongly recommend others measure it, particularly given this kind of a result. So completely uh, agree with you on that. And the uh, second question goes to Thomas. Um, you showed these changes in GIP and GLP-1 and glucagon. So do you explain the increase in glucose production by the glucagon alone, or would you say there is more? And what, are you, what roles do we attribute to the improvements to GIP and GLP-1? Yeah, this is a very good question. Actually, the, uh, our data will not um, give the best answer here because we have the, um, the, have the hyperinsulinemia and we have started to uh, calculate glucagon and insulin ratios and we, we have the feeling that the absolute glucagon concentrations do, you know, do not tell you a lot. But what I can say is that with isomaltolose, you have an um, increase of the insulin to glucagon ratio. And I think this is the most important reason why we see these effects on the glucose kinetics. And regarding the GLP-1, um, the, uh, there is another publication from MEDA from 2013 who also found an increase in GLP-1 in humans. It has been also done in rats. So, but we are, we are not happy with the data because we, we don't have the, found the right correlation of the GLP-1 to, to the hyperinsulinemia. Uh, we were actually uh, a little surprised that it was going up uh, at all. And also we think that uh, some of the risk, um, effects that we see are not hormone dependent. So, the, so we have some evidence that there are non-hormone dependent effects here. Jenny Brenmiller. Um, Jenny Brand Miller, University of Sydney. My questions for Dr. Meller. Um, we in Sydney, one of the bread manufacturers 
very, um, fair, very carefully developed a low GI white bread. And I know that it was based on guar gum. I don't know what the formulation was. But it had, no, it had beautiful consistency, just like white bread. Um, you couldn't tell the difference by appearance. And so they put it into production and um, with the claim, clearly, that it was low GI to help with marketing. But what happened in practice was that in the factory, the food technologists were found finding that the guar gum was so sticky in the equipment that it spoiled things. So what they decided to do was um, <coughs> leave out the guar gum till the last minute and add it at the final step in production. And then what happened in practice is that they forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so we found by testing on a regular basis that the GI had climbed back to 70. So best, best laid plans of mice and men. I, I think there's two things there. One, I think, uh, and, and I think other people, we, certainly in industry, will, uh, will probably be sympathetic to this point, that things that work are not edible in the fiber world and things that are edible don't work. Um, that's a very gross generalization, but I think it is one of the challenges uh, to find things which are both consumer acceptable uh, and efficacious. In the case of the guar gum, it's a, it's, an, it's, it's a really nice story because actually the biggest problem was not this aroma, which probably could have dealt with, might have been a cost issue buying a different, uh, a better refined guar gum or something. But in fact, it was the dough handling properties because this is a mix that people make at home. Uh, they have a very traditional way of making it. They judge when it's done sufficiently based on, on certain dough properties. Um, and consumers very quickly picked up from the dough handling that there was something uh, wrong uh, with the product. And, uh, and it wasn't acceptable with those high levels of viscous uh, fibers added at that point. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, we have time for two more questions or comments. Uh, first is Gabriel Riccardi. I have two questions. The first one, following up this subject with Dr. Mela, uh, we, we have some experience with viscose fiber, and our experience is that they, they, uh, working on viscosity is very much dependent on the size of the meat. So if you utilize a food uh, which is the, based on viscose fiber, uh, in isolation, you get very good result. But when you include that in a, in a, in a meal, then the, the effect is going to, to be reduced. That was our experience, both with guar, uh, uh, guar and also with glucomanna. So I, I wonder, did you test your product also within a meal? We haven't done that yet for this, but I completely agree with you that for all of these uh, kinds of innovations which are intended for a single product, which is a component of a larger meal, uh, it, is in, it is important to test them within a meal context. Um, and that is just good due diligence uh, to ensure that actually what you're promising is, is, is actually operating that way for the consumers. You anticipate that the effects will be uh, smaller. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it should still be apparent uh, in order to, to sustain a claim. So Thank it's you. a good point, and I agree with you. And then I, <coughs> I have a question to, to Geoffrey. Uh, you, you presented very nice data, and, uh, and thank you for, for your presentation. There is one aspect which I think needs to be a little bit more clarified in relation to the impact of glycemic index in explaining the variability when you take into account other uh, healthy aspects of the food. Uh, I wonder, did you consider the frequency of consumption in different foods that you have evaluated? Because I understand that, I mean, you have, you have so many foods, but some of them are utilized from very few people and very small amount. And some instead, like for instance, legumes, can be utilized more frequently and can be uh, also utilized in larger quantities. Don't you think that you should take into account in your, into your correlation of the frequency of consume, consumption and the, the amount that is, so that you give the right weight to what happens in reality uh, in the population? I think that's a very good point. And the reason that it wasn't done was that it's going to take more time to do that and there's not been time to get around to doing it. Uh, whether it will show uh, something that's really important is difficult to say for sure. But it's very difficult to believe that uh, from the results that we've got, it's going to make a, a magnificent difference. I would suggest, if I'm going to predict at this stage, and I can only predict in, the, in a very poor way, um, that you're not going to get uh, more than 50% of either GI or GL 
explained, and for GL, I wouldn't have thought it was going to be more than 20 percent. And the last question or comment, David Jenkins. David Jenkins, Toronto. I really enjoyed the session and all the speakers. Um, but for Thomas and David, I want to have your opinion on the effect of uh, a fiber, a low glycemic index food, slow release carbohydrates on hepatic glucose output, because I think that's, that's something important uh, as opposed to disposal. How does one actually account for the second meal effect? which may be even given as a, an intravenous glucose tolerance and still one gets uh, a better uh, decay of glucose um, in that situation. Uh, well, uh, I'll give a quick answer, which is a slightly, un well, I won't say it's uninformed. It's informed by something which somebody said two days ago, um, which was the, uh, and I can't remember which speaker mentioned about a potential of direct effect of free fatty, uh, sorry, volatile fatty acids on hepatic glucose production. Now, that was something which was new for me, but the kind of timing of, of that effect and the fact that in, in both of our cases we're seeing these effects on hepatic uh, glucose production, that could work for me as an explanation. It's certainly a hypothesis, but I, I've, I, I'm, 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 I've not really seen the evidence for that uh, other than and somebody said it, so I, I must believe it. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know if I have understood your question correctly, but I take it like this. You would like to know whether you can uh, use uh, methods like stable isotope methods or glucose kinetic flux methods in a more complicated setting like FIBA, uh, how you label the FIBA, FIBA whether you can uh, use um, well intravenous glucose tolerance tests. And I think this is very difficult. Um, if you do some ingestion with some labeled material and you add it with an intravenous glucose tolerance test, um, um, that will be difficult as a method if you combine this. Uh, I think that um, David's um, way to go for it is the best way. There's something, uh, um, probably there was some wheat uh, generation uh, in the, you named it the conditions, the conditions yeah. of growing. Under 13 so you CO2. were able to yeah. increase this, uh, the carbon-13 yes. uh, enrichment. Um, enrichment. Yeah. That is, I think, a very good way to go but it's also very complicated because you have to go for a lot of uh, uh, pre um, preliminary uh, experiments, actually, to find if your tracer-tri-C ratio is really <coughs> increasing in blood. Um, but I think this is a very good way to go if you want to transfer these, this model to a more complicated structure like FIBA or meals. And I think the methodology is not adequate at the moment. It has to be developed. And regarding the intravenous glucose tolerance test, um, it doesn't work so nicely in type 2 diabetes. You always have very high, very, uh, a very high variability here. It works better in, uh, in healthy persons, and only if you want to go for a good measure of insulin sensitivity. What it measures is peripheral insulin sensitivity, and not so much hepatic insulin sensitivity. So you need, if, if you want to go for the liver, if you're interested in the liver, and if you want to abrogate all the other organs like brain and pancreas and I don't know, uh, you must go really for uh, labeling products and then look what, the, what happens. And for the end, I would like to thank uh, all uh, presenters for their lecture and fru fruitful discussion. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.